You know, I may always be in the football game, that's okay. You know, I'm glad to be here. I'm really honored for the opportunity to talk to you about uh, medical school. I hope this will be worth your while. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure some of you have heard me before. If that's the case, there are no new jokes. Um, but anyway, let me just tell you what I like, hope to accomplish today. Uh, I'd like to try to discuss the principles of medical student school selection Aaron Zell, every place. You know, I can probably yell loud enough that you can hear. Is it, is it better if I do this? Yeah. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, so you, you can hear me in the back all right? Great. So <clears throat> what I hope to do is discuss the principles of medical school selection in general. Okay. Uh, I have had some interaction with my counterparts at other medical schools throughout the country, and I think that I can give you sort of a general idea. I'd like to talk about what criteria schools use and, you know, and use the University of Utah School of Medicine as an example of that. And then since I'm sure many of you are somewhat interested in what we do up the, up the roadways, uh, I'll talk about our procedures uh, more specifically. It is true that the University of Utah School of Medicine has a very exacting, specific procedure, uh, maybe more so than some of the other medical schools you might encounter. However, the bad news is, that this is likely uh, to become more of the rule rather than the exception as other schools move forward. Now, it's already mentioned, y'all know who my, <clears throat> my big brother is. There's another family relationship that every time I come down here, everybody asks me about, and so I'd like to clear that up before we go any further. I am in no way related to Henry Winkler. <laughs> I get asked that a lot, you know, in the temple, every place, you know, and. Uh, so let me just clear that up, and Mr. Winkler's people have asked me to clarify that. They're, they're, they're bothered by it. So anyway, let's just talk about you know, what medical schools in general are looking for. And again, I'll use the school that I represent uh, more specifically. Our school has three major missions. Uh, it's education, research, and clinical, ser uh, clinical service. The missions are closely interrelated, and they, they help each other, and in turn are helped by the other. And we consider them to be of equal importance. Now that's something we keep in mind as we decide who's going to come to medical school. Now I pulled this straight out of our admissions brochure and if you have one it's a collector's item. Um, hold on to it. Everything we, uh, that I'm going to tell you, that everything we have is in fact online. Uh, but uh, you've probably heard there's been some budget cuts statewide and that's affected us and so uh, we're going electronic and so that nice little glossy brochure that we used to do is, is gone. But all the information is in it. And this, this comes from that. So our goal is to select the most capable students. We want a balanced but heterogeneous group that will excel both in the art and the science of medicine. Uh, we think that a variety of perspectives and experiences prepare students to care for patients in all walks of life and in every segment of society. And, and we really do feel that very carefully. Now, <clears throat> you know, I did okay in fourth grade spelling. Uh, but it wasn't until the last few years that I learned that the word diversity is actually a four-letter word. Uh, a lot of people really criticize that because our school, like every other school and many other institutions, has fairly, you know, clearly stated goals of having a diverse student body. But let's talk about what that means. And so I've got this slide and the next slide uh, that are pulled from some significant legal decisions that affect all this. So the concept of diversity is associated with achieving educational outcomes cannot relate solely to race or ethnicity, nor can it be just about the numbers. In other words, you can't just say we want X number of one kind of person, X, kind of, X number of another kind of person. Otherwise, this concept will likely reflect more of an issue of racial balancing, which is specifically forbidden under current case law. Um, <coughs> another definition comes from a very important case. As used by medical schools in establishing student-related goals and objectives, the term diversity should be defined in a broadly inclusive manner. And I think the word inclusive is very, very important. I'll come back to that in just a sec. Which may include personal attributes, experiential factors, demographics, or other considerations. It may also include a focus on race and ethnicity, to be sure, but it must do so in the context of broader diversity-related educational interests and goals that the school clearly explains in its policies. The two court cases this comes from are famous, at least as far as medical education in medical admissions go. The first one is, is Grutter versus Bollinger, which is the University of Michigan uh, lawsuit, actually a law school is issue. It's the, a female student denied access to the law school at the University of Michigan, filed this, this suit. And then 
you may hear the state of uh, California versus Baki, which is kind of goes back to my day of trying to get in medical school. An otherwise well qualified candidate alleged that he was denied admission to the University of California, Davis, because of his race. In other words, he implied that less qualified people were admitted to the institution because they were of a specific ethnic background. So these two decisions color everything we do. And so you probably heard the term affirmative action. So I've decided that I could uh, go ahead and display the University of Utah School of Medicine's affirmative action plan here for you. That's it. <laughs> we don't have one. Okay? Now, <clears throat> every, every seven to eight years, our medical school, like every other medical school in the country, is subjected to a reaccreditation review. That happens to all institutions. You've gone through it here. And they have some very specific uh, requirements. One of those requirements is that we have a diversity program. So now six years ago, when uh, the Liaison Committee on Medical Education, which is a, is a combination of people from the Association of American Medical Colleges as well as the American Medical Association, they wanted to know what our diversity program was. And we said, well, we look for people who have had diverse experiences. And they said, great, perfect. Now, <clears throat> we have some very diverse experiences in our group. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But just so you know, we actually do have some quotas. The medical school agrees with the legislature, and this agreement is longstanding, predates me going to medical school, that 75% of all seats in the School of Medicine in any class, at least 75%, will be reserved for residents of the state of Utah. Now, that's been the case ever since before I went to medical school, and I think was certainly the case when my older brothers attended this medical school. Uh, when, and they're older than I am, so you know, it's really a long time ago. <laughs> but the wording is at least. Now, this is not law, this is a handshake. And uh, you know, as we've been talking with our legislature about redefining who, what constitutes a Utah resident, which may be of interest to some of you, um, <clears throat> they said, well, let's go back and look at the language in that original law, and no one can find it. <coughs> But what we can find in the University of Utah records is that sometime, a long time ago, somebody shook hands with the legislature and said, we'll do that. Now, our current fourth year class has 81% residents of the state of Utah. <coughs> Why is that? Well, we admit in the order of qualification. And so in that year, there were more qualified people who were residents of the state of Utah. Um, <clears throat> I'm still hearing about that because in so doing, we lost out-of-state tuition for six people. That turns into about $250,000, uh, which they want to charge to my American Express card. Uh, won't do that. We also have a contract with the state of Idaho, uh, which guarantees that there'll be eight Idahoans in every class. Now, that's a contract that comes up every few years for renewal and renegotiation, uh, and that number has gone up and down. Uh, I think we're in the second year of that contract. So now you can see this is the current first-year class. Uh, if you look closely, some of you will see friends. Uh, faculty may see former students. Uh, these people were all admitted based on their performance under the same criteria. In other words, nobody got special treatment for anything. And in fact, we don't even think about where they come from in terms of the school they're from until later on when I have to make talks like this and people ask me. But in that group, uh, for you, those of you that have served missions, uh, there are 42 return missionaries. Okay, there are 30 women, and depending on which definition of minority you use, there are 11 minorities. Okay, there's clearly one African American here on the bottom row. But none of them were admitted because of any of those things. They were admitted because of the qualifications <coughs> they brought to the table. So. When I show you a blank slide talking about our affirmative action plan, that's exactly what it is. We do have <clears throat> an office that used to be called the Office of Diversity and, Out and Community Outreach. We discovered that the perception of all that was that these people were out holding seminars and groups for only for people who were of minority status. And so we closed the office down for a day and said, go back and reconsider your goals, rewrite your mission statement. It's now the Office of Inclusion and Outreach because the idea is we want to include rather than exclude anyone. Now more to the point, what are the principles that really guide who we look for? Um, those of you that are familiar with the process understand there's a test called the Medical College Admissions Test or the MCAT. 
The MCAT undergoes a systematic review about every 15 years or so. It's currently under review. I happen to be on that committee, so I was privy to these data, which I'm showing you here, where all the admissions officers at all the allopathic medical schools, that's the MD schools in the United States, were surveyed and asked, what do you most want to see in your applicants? In the students you'd like to bring into your medical school, what are the qualities that you would most like to see? And here they are, you know, sort of ranked in, by importance, and you can see on the scale, if you got a, you know, they rank it on a five through one, five is extremely important, one is not important at all. And there were a number of attributes that were, were assayed. But if you look at that, you'll see that uh, there are a lot of things that medical school admissions officers are very interested in, which really are not reflected in grade point average or in a multiple choice test, can't be reflected in a multiple choice test. Now, the committee that's looking at the test to review it and redesign it, of course, has been tasked with making the perfect examination that will solve all these problems. Um, I really enjoy my trips to Washington, D.C. to sit on this committee where we argue for hours and hours and hours, go to dinner, argue some more, and we still agree that we're probably not going to be able to improve on this, but we're looking at it. Okay? But there are some qualities there that I think are very important that you should look at and think about. Um, you know, maturity, curiosity, self-discipline, professionalism. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to assess accessibility to memorize. It's less easy to assess critical thinking. Integrating information is hard to assess on a single examination. And so we have to do some other things. So the admissions philosophy that we follow and that is followed by nearly every allopathic medical school in the country uh, is that the MCAT and GPA serve as important threshold measures. In other words, you have to have a certain degree of intellectual capacity, as evidenced by your performance in class, and a certain level of ability to respond under pressure, as evidenced by the MCAT exam, in order to succeed in medicine, not just in medical school. Okay? What has been discovered, and this has been intensely studied over the last five or six years, is that above this threshold, these measures, which all of us think are great, and doggone it, if it were possible to pick the best medical students based solely on the numbers reflected in an MCAT exam or a GPA, my job would be simple. All I'd have to do is have the numbers. I wouldn't even have to go in the office. We'd have a, calcu we'd have a calculator. Somebody enter the data on the computer, it would be great. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. Now, if you're at all familiar with medical education literature, you know that the MCAT exam does correlate with step one of the United States Medical License Examination, the board exam. That's true. Performance on the test in one area does predict ability to perform in another test. And that's really what it is. Uh, that's not trivial because you have to pass that exam in nation to proceed in medical school and, and there are three steps to it. And you have to pass all three steps before you can be licensed in the United States. But it does not tell us everything we need to know about the quality of the person and the quality of the physician. So those things that are not readily measured in the testing environment or reflected by GPA are still very important to us. And I've just put a couple of examples there. How do you measure compassion or professionalism or curiosity or, for that matter, self-discipline? So the procedure has to go on a little bit. We look at some other criteria, and I've listed our criteria here uh, only because those are the ones I'm sure of. But I can tell you, and those of you that are in the pipeline looking for a medical school, that nearly every medical school in the country, at least the MD schools, looks at the same things. They may do it a little differently than the University of Utah does, but trust me, they're interested in the same things. Um, you know, if, if I could get paid for the talks I give to the medical schools, I could really retire, and I could afford to send all my children to BYU. But uh, <clears throat> these are the things. Everybody looks at MCAT scores and GPA, like I talked about. Those are thresholds. But they are not the end-all and be-all. Okay? So what you ought to know is that in 2007, which is the last year for which I have good data on this, there were about... 75 people with a GPA above 3.8 and an MCAT score above 39. Okay, so yeah, those that know about the exam understand those are really that's, those are good numbers, right? Who were not accepted to any medical school. Okay, so there is no guaranteed trip home with any of this. So we look at things like extracurricular activities, community service, leadership experience, research, patient exposure, and physician shadowing. And what we're looking at there is how you change as a person with this. Now, medical schools have different missions and they respond to different, um, you know, 
different pressures from different folks. And so uh, I've just listed some of those things that, that move medical schools around. There are the external rankings, and, and, and I think all administrators of colleges and universities understand about the U.S. News and World Report. The nation's best law schools, the best medical schools, the best undergraduate schools, okay? Um, that's one of them. That's the most famous one. That's the biggest one to, to deal with. And you know, U.S. News and World Report makes more money on those rating systems than they do on any news report, okay? So you know, there have been those that have suggested they change their name, but they're not going to do that. But there are other review organizations, and uh, you know, some of those we don't respond to. I put Princeton Review up there because I've been at war with them for a couple of years. Uh, they sent me you know, a questionnaire to fill out about our school, and it was pretty extensive, when I wrote back and said, don't think so. And they said, yeah, you've got to do this. <clears throat> we have a right. The First Amendment guarantees us the right. This stuff is in, is in the public domain. You have to supply it to us. And so I wrote back and said, if it's in the public domain, you get it. <laughs> So then they wrote a threatening letter saying that if I didn't respond, that they were going to blackball us and that we would not be able to get any applicants from the eastern seaboard. Now, there must be some of the students here that are from the east, okay? Uh, I don't think we've had a whole lot of trouble reaching you. Um, <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'll take that risk. And uh, so then they wrote to the university president and said that I was being mean. <laughs> <laughs> so if you read the University of Utah's blurb in the Princeton Review, it's about eight years old because uh, we have refused to update it. I did say we would do it. I estimated that it would cost our, our staff five hours to fill out all the information they wanted, and I was willing to bill our staff's time at sixty dollars an hour. And so as soon as they had to check, we would do this, and that stopped it. The point is that there's a lot of pressure on medical schools to do things just because somebody else wants them to. Uh, some medical schools are research oriented, <coughs> some are primary care schools, and so they're looking for applicants that may fit one or the other of those kind of uh, classifications. Private schools tend to look for a different kind of applicant than the state supported schools. You know, most state supported schools feel an obligation to residents of their own state. We obviously do. However, some state supported schools, as the recession deepens, are actually looking for out of state people because they can charge them out of state tuition, which is a lot more. You know, I refer you back to my previous comment about how I cost the medical school a quarter of a million dollars by admitting too many people from Utah. Uh, and then some serve specific populations. Uh, anybody here from Arizona? Okay, so the University of Arizona will not even look at an application unless you're an Arizona resident or you grew up on a reservation that borders the state of Arizona, which you know includes a lot of people, so Native American or an Arizona resident. But a Utah resident can apply to Arizona and get a very nice form letter back and say, sorry, okay? Anybody here from North Dakota? Okay, North Dakota has a special program aimed at Native Americans. It's a small medical school, but they are specifically looking to educate Native Americans. These are things that dictate how medical schools look at their applicants. So let's talk about our specific process. Uh, we begin after we get your application from the American Medical College Application Service, or the dreaded AMCAS, that one you fill out online, uh, by doing the, uh, the usual screens. Our, our bar for GPA is pretty low, okay? Now those of you that have applied or in the process of applying know that, that you're actually looking at three grade point averages. Biology, chemistry, physics, and math, which are considered the science courses. Anything that's not biology, chemistry, physics, or math. And then your overall grade point average. And as far as we're concerned, all three of those have to be 3.0 or better. Now that's actually not a medical school rule, that's a University of Utah rule. Uh, you can't get into a graduate program at the University of Utah without <coughs> special permission unless your undergraduate GPA is 3.0 or better. <coughs> now, the MCAT, those of you that have taken that know that the MCAT comes in three subject areas and a writing sample. The subject areas are each graded on a 1 to 15 scale, uh, 15 being really, really good, uh, 1 being you know, not so good. Um, and so we insist that you have at least a 7, which is somewhere below between the 40th and 50th percentile most years in every area. Not an average of seven, but, an, but seven in every area before we'll read your application. When it comes time to figuring in where the MCAT fits, we look at your cumulative score. Then you have to either be a Utah resident, or if you're not a Utah resident, you have to have significant ties to the state of Utah. The significant ties would mean I've lived in Utah, such as I've attended Brigham Young University. Uh, I own property in Utah. I have first degree rel relatives in Utah whose addresses I can provide and that can be verified, okay? Um, if you're applying to our MD-PhD program, you can do that without Utah ties. 
that's a very small program funded differently and, and so we'll accept people without Utah ties. Or if you belong to an underrepresented minority, and this of course ties into some federal law. Now, that means we'll read your application. That doesn't mean that an underrepresented minority person gets any special consideration after the application crosses our door. Okay? Then again, if you're an Idaho <coughs> resident, but you have to be certified to be an Idaho resident, and the applicants, applicants that apply to the University of Utah get their certification through Idaho State University. They send you a letter saying congratulations, and they send us a copy of that letter. If without that, then you're just another out-of-stater. Okay? So after you get to that point, then we send you <coughs> what we call secondary application, a request for secondary application materials. And those secondary application materials are a second personal statement. You've already written one for the AMCAS application, but we want another one. And this one should tell us a little bit more about you, why the University of Utah, in addition to why medicine. Now we're going to read them both, so it's an unwise thing to do to copy and paste the, the first one into the second one. Uh, we want a list of all the courses that you're currently taking and all the courses you intend to take between the time of your application and the time you start medical school. And we take this very, very seriously. Um, failure to complete all those courses that you put in your current course list is grounds for us to withdraw our offer. And every year, at least one or two people think we're kidding about that and try to, you know, gee, I don't really want to get that French minor after all. Um, I don't really want to get that honors degree because son of a gun that requires that senior thesis. You know, I don't want to do this or that for whatever reason. And this results in withdrawal of offer. And every year we have to take somebody's application or somebody's position away because of that. So then we look at what we call the activities form, which is where you tell us about your participation in six areas of activity. I'll talk more about that in just a second. And then we ask for six letters of recommendation. Now, when I first got this job, I used to hear a lot of moaning and groaning. Oh, you want six letters of recommendation. How can that be fair? I went to a seminar with a, num a number of other uh, admissions deans, and the first guy to speak said, well, I recommend that you get at least 10 letters. And nobody moaned or groaned. I thought, wait a minute, wait, we're only getting six. <coughs> so think about it this way. This is six opportunities for you to get highly recommended, but they're specific letters. In other words, we're not measuring these letters. Um, we're looking at them in specific areas. So three of them should be from professors who've taught you in class and given you a grade. Okay, the reason for that is, is that your in-class demeanor is kind of important to us. We will lock you in the room with a bunch of other people and you'll spend a considerable time there for a couple of years. And if you're a disruptive influence in class, we'd like to know about that up front. Okay, one of those professors has to be a science professor, but not all three of them. All three of them can be, but at least one has to be. And then we want a letter from someone documenting your community service, someone documenting your clinical exposure, and someone who could document your research performance. Now, oftentimes, especially in an institution like Brigham Young University, the person who has supervised you in research has also taught you in class. We do not make that person write two letters. One letter will suffice as long as both activities are specifically mentioned in the letter. So, let's go over these areas of activity and let's talk about why they're important and, and what you should try to get out of them. Okay? So, we want to look at your extracurricular activities mostly because we want to know how you balance your time. So we define that as stuff you do outside of going to school full time. Now, if you're going to, if you're working part, working full time, going to school part time, then we're kind of interested in what you're doing when you're not working. And so, in that sense, school can be sort of an extracurricular activity. This can include your church work, your hobbies, family, your job, um, and it can also include the time you spend doing other things that we're requiring you to do. Now, this demonstrates your ability to set appropriate priorities. Um, you know, years ago, <coughs> I have a daughter who uh, went to the University of Utah with a really fine scholarship. She got paid to go to school. Now, I let her live at home, and so I would assume that, uh, you know, I was gonna get the extra, you know. After she bought her books and stuff like that, there was usually somewhere around $40. <coughs> she didn't see it that way, but anyway, this was fine, until she decided to study abroad. And study abroad was not covered by her scholarship. And it was also not covered by her father. <laughs> and so she had to get a job. And she remarked that it was much more difficult to maintain good grades uh, when you're working than it is when you just have to you know, come home and study and have a social life. Okay, well this is what we're looking for. This is how you tell us that you can set priorities, that you can manage your time effectively, and that you're able to do more than one thing. Why is that important? Only on television. Does a physician have one patient a week? Okay. Um, 
You know, you, you have to be able to deal with more than one situation at a time. Community volunteer service is also quite important to us. Um, this we define as involvement in an activity without constraint. In other words, you didn't have to do it, and no one promised you anything. Okay. So in that regard, a service learning course, wherein you're completing a course, getting a grade, or getting credit, does not meet this requirement. The Peace Corps, AmeriCorps, those kind of things, all wonderful activities, do not fill this requirement. By the same token, those of you that have served missions, your time spent proselytizing does not satisfy this requirement. However, most missionaries will actually do community service during the mission, and those few hours a week you spend teaching English or working in the hospital, that kind of stuff, can be recorded and will, uh, will be considered as, satisfaction, as satisfying this requirement, okay? But remember that we, we are not completely down. We know that there are 168 hours in a week total, and so we don't think anyone does 168 hours a week of service because there is sleeping, eating, that kind of stuff. There's a question. I was just curious, do we need to have information that we could document where we did service and contact information? That's a good question. They don't hear that. How do you document this? With this and other things, um, you know, part of this is your integrity, but part of this, of course, is this letter of recommendation. So if your application said, you know, I worked at, uh, you know, the Children's Center teaching kids to read. I was there 40 hours a week, and I did that for three years. And we get the letter from so-and-so that said, Jeb was great. Every Friday he came for an hour, and he's been doing this for the last three months. Okay? Um, so, you know, we, we, we look for those kinds of things. But yeah, can you fool us? Of course you can. Um, we're not going to expect to see a time card, but we are going to raise our eyebrows if it seems you know, unreasonable, okay? Leadership. Um, we define this as when you held some sort of position or responsibility where you had to deal with other people and they were depending on you, okay? So you can be a TA, you can be a tutor, uh, you can be the third assistant soccer coach, you don't have to be the president of the club. You don't have to be the team captain. All those are fine. Church leadership positions are fine. Um, what we're looking for is your willingness to accept responsibility as well as credit. Okay. Now, you know, I, I, I made an allusion to an unfortunate football game that uh, took place on your campus not too long ago. You know, now the, the, the previous year, uh, Coach Whittingham, who you know played for some school in Utah. Um, you know, he was coach of the year, undefeated, beat Alabama in the Sugar Bowl, you know, on a big high. Uh, people were taking him out to dinner, you know. Okay, then you lose to BYU in overtime, and suddenly that's not quite the same, all right. Uh, but he has to accept that responsibility, and frankly, he did. Uh, just the same as he ex 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 accepted the accolades the previous year when things went much better, okay. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for your willingness to accept responsibility. So, uh, Many of you, like I say, have church responsibilities that, uh, that indicate you have leadership capacity. I can tell you every year we get about 300 applications from returned missionaries. Uh, about 293 of those have been at least own leaders or assistants to the president, okay? So that by itself is not going to really distinguish you. I would encourage you to look for opportunities to assume leadership positions outside the church. Not because we're not going to accept your leadership responsibility, I'll tell you guys, there are two return mission, former mission presidents, return mission presidents, sitting on the uh, missions committee. <coughs> a whole bunch of return missionaries and a couple of bishops. You know, so it's not that we don't understand the church stuff, but we also recognize that you typically don't campaign. Sometimes you do to be elders quorum president or recite president. Okay? <laughs> and uh, and so you know, but you do it when you're asked. So one thing that's good for you to do is show that you can step up and assume responsibility when you weren't called from the Lord to do it. Okay? Research, uh, very important for us. The University of Utah School of Medicine has a higher percentage of its students involved in active research than any other medical school in the country. Uh, we think it's important. So what we expect is you've been involved in the investigation of a hypothesis. Okay? Supervised by somebody who himself or herself has research credentials. And now, every faculty member at BYU has acceptable research credentials as far as we're concerned, okay? But two guys shouldn't get together and say, okay, I'll write your letter, you write mine, and, and we'll put some mouth through the maze and stuff like that, okay? When we ask you about this, we want to know what the hypothesis was, and, and we want to know what you're really doing. Even if you're just playing a very small technical role, um, that's okay. 
as long as you know where your work fit with the larger project and you understand the overall hypothesis being investigated. One of the things that distinguishes Brigham Young University from most other undergraduate institutions in the country, including the University of Utah, is the access to meaningful research for undergraduates. Okay? So you have an opportunity, if you are diligent and if you prove yourself qualified, to get involved in some really important research as an undergraduate. This is a tremendous advantage for you as you pursue your medical school application. Okay? Uh, so if you come from Brigham Young University and tell us, gee, I really didn't get a chance to do research, um, that tells us a lot about you. Yeah? Would it be better to have a lot of different, um, maybe like two, two research projects that you've involved with different professors, or like one long <coughs> research, couple research projects with the same professor? That's a, that's a great question. The question was, is it better to have lots of different projects or one in-depth project? Is that correct? Okay. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Okay. What we're looking for here is that you understand how to investigate a hypothesis, that you have learned that, that you have learned the good and the bad about scientific research. Now, <clears throat> up until I got moved from a real office down to the cubbyhole that I now, that I now habitate as the dean of admissions, um, I used to keep the, the data books from my first year as a, as a research fellow on my shelf. And the reason why I did that is to remind me that you know, life can be bad and you can get over it. Because I have, I have eight volumes of absolutely meaningless data. You know? Eight volumes, which corresponds to six and a half months of very expensive, very frustrating, 14 hour long, unsuccessful experiments. Okay? All right? So what I learned from that is it ain't always easy, it ain't always fun. Finally, when I figured out what was wrong with my assay, I was able to get my project done in 10 days, and that was the first paper I got, you know? But, but it was preceded by some really painful stuff. Those are lessons that you can learn, and we think that's important, and that's what we're after. So however you do that. Now, I would say that a two-week project is probably not gonna matter very much to the committee. So when in doubt, be in doubt. We really want you to have had the experience of, of digging deep, and so in general, a, prog a project of longer duration is going to be better for you. But I'll, I'll say this now and I'll say it again. Uh, it's not what you do. It's what you learn from what you do that really matters to the admissions committee. Now, physician shadowing. What this means is you've got to go and observe a physician as he or she cares for and treats patients and carries out the other responsibilities of medical practice. And I think it's a good idea for you to see other things besides the fun stuff, like looking at the little kid's ears. Now, out in my car, in my briefcase, are 20 clinic notes that remain undictated. Okay? I've got another 48 hours to get those in before I'm in trouble. Okay? Um, the fun part of my job as a physician is seeing the patients. My patients are my friends. Most of these people are, are, are folks that I follow for a long time. When the weather's like this and we've got all this inversion stuff, uh, people with lung problems come in a lot, so I'm seeing a lot of my close friends now. Uh, but then I have to document all this. And then I have to fill out insurance forms. And then I have to make phone calls and check labs. None of that stuff is really a lot of fun for me, but it's still part of the job. So I want you to find out what it's like to be a physician, and you should study a physician. Now, <clears throat> shadowing other kind of health care providers may be a worthwhile experience in terms of clinical exposure, but it does not tell you what a physician does, okay? So, shadowing a dentist, a veterinarian. I was at the vet's office this morning with my dog. I thought, man, what a life, you know. Somebody else does all the work, and you come in and give the dog a shot, and pat him on the head, and it's a lot of money. I wish I could do that. Um, and then, you know, I don't love all, all animals, just dogs. Um, <laughs> but physical therapists, nurse practitioners, all these people do important work, but it's not what the physician does, okay? And we want you to find out what the physician does. If, at the end of that time, you say, gosh, you know, if I had to spend that much time sitting in a corner dictating, or if I had to fill out that many papers, or if I had to sit at my desk on the phone arguing with insurance companies, you know, I think I'd kill myself. Save your life and get out now, because you'll have to, and it's going to be worse. You know, it's never going to get better, as far as I can tell. The other thing, and this is a specific warning for some of you, since there is a residency training program at Utah Valley Regional Medical Center, is you cannot expect credit to sh shadowing tra physicians in training. So residents in the family practice residency at Utah Valley should be considered off limits. Now you may know some of these people personally and they may say, sure, come on. But I'll tell you, we're gonna ask who the physicians were. And we know who those people are. And 
if the name appears in both places on your application, you're really in trouble. Reason being, first of all, that's not the life you're going to live long term. Sure, they work hard. That's a given. That's probably a violation of the Health Information Protection and Accountability Act. And if you do that, both the resident and the hospital can be sanctioned, and we can be sanctioned for saying you should do it. So, don't do it. I promise bad sequela for your application if you do. Right, Dr. Kaiser? Okay. Now, different from this is being around sick people. We want you to have some sick patient exposure, um, and this is where you're actually involved with patients providing care. So you can be a medical assistant, you can be um, a transporter, that kind of stuff. Uh, if you're a housekeeper and you're cleaning up after the patients, as distasteful and uncomfortable as that might be, we do not give awards for that. Okay, that's not acceptable. If you're a pharmacy tech, putting pills in the, in the bottles for patients, that doesn't count either. So you really need some direct contact. And this is distinct and different from the time spent shadowing a physician. When you're shadowing a physician, we expect you to learn about physician lifestyle. When you're with sick people, we expect you to learn about what it's like to be around sick people and learn whether or not you can tolerate that. Okay, I've said this before, if there's anything that I'm saying today that those of you that are applying for medical school want to write down, and I'm flattered you're taking notes. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there's an exam on this or not. I haven't submitted any questions. Okay, but if you're going to write down anything, this is what you should write down. It's not what you do. It's what you learn from what you do that makes the difference. Okay, that's what we're most interested in when we talk to you. So let's find out how we find that out. Okay, we interview you. I get this from the law school all the time. We don't waste any time interviewing people. We look at their scores and their grades. Well, that's fine. Uh, the business school says, you know, interviews don't really tell you what you need to know. Well, they may not tell you what you need to know for business, but we think they do tell us some important things. And so we have you uh, sit down independently with two separate interviewers. Now, for the first time, both these interviews are conducted by faculty members. We used to have medical students participating, but as the size of our applicant pool has, has grown, we are not, unable to keep up with it with students who are also out doing their own interviewing for residency programs right now. But these interviewers will work independently. They will not share <laughs> notes or compare anything. But they're really looking for your preparation, OK? They're not going to see your GPA, your MCAT scores. So the questions are all about what you have learned from your previous experiences, OK? So like I say, that's really important to us. Uh, you also need to know that even though interviewers provide important information, they generate a report, they don't vote on who gets into medical school. That's done by another committee that we call the Selection Committee. And that's composed of clinical basic science faculty from the medical school, some community physicians, some fourth year medical students, and there is one behavioral scientist from the community that sits on this committee as well. Okay? Uh, they don't ever meet you, they, but they get to know your file really well. Again, they do not see your GPA, your MCAT scores. They know that you're academically qualified. And after a very spirited discussion which you're during which the application is presented in some detail and aggressively dissected, uh, then they give you a ranking on a private ballot. So they all walk out of the meeting not knowing who's been accepted to medical school. And part of the reason is because we do calculate what's called a selection score. We take the average votes from the selection committee the average of votes, and we have them rank you on an A through E scale, and then we convert that into a grade point average. You know, four, th four for an A, three points for a B, that kind of thing. Uh, the reason why we don't let them just give you a number is then they start doing stuff like 3.76. Uh, uh, this technique is not refined enough to allow for that. Uh, but we, we, we calculate that average, and that constitutes 80% of what your final selection score is going to be. Then we go back and look at that GPA and the MCAT. Now, in terms of grade point average, um, we will compare your GPA, you folks here, with the average grade point average from people from BYU who have gone on to medical school, any medical school. <coughs> that database is available to us. So you will not be compared to, to grade grubbers from institutions where it's really easy to get an A. You know, you'd be compared to the same rigor that's, you know, that affected you <coughs> that provides the, the basis for comparison for everything we do in terms of your grade. We compare your MCAT score to the national means. Years ago, we used to compare it on a school specific basis like we did grade point average. Uh, the state legislature thought that was terrible because after all, it's a national test. So we actually did the analysis and found out that over the range of test scores where people get accepted to medical school, it comes out just about the same, okay? So <clears throat> we are gonna compare your scores 
And then using a statistical analysis and algorithm that's in the computer, uh, this gives you a score. And we rank everybody in order of score, and that's the order in which we admit to medical school. Okay? So let me summarize what I said, and then maybe I'll have a couple minutes and you can ask me some specific questions. Uh, this is a tough process. Uh, I wish it were perfect. Boy, do I wish it were perfect, because that would save me a lot of phone calls. Um, the need, you need to know, and I'm sure you realize this, that the number of well-qualified people far exceeds the number of spots we have, especially now that we've got to decrease our class size. Um, moreover, it's important to understand how much weight we play on what we call the non-cognitive, in other words, the non-GPA, non-MCAT attributes of every candidate. Okay, so <clears throat> when your mom calls me and says, my boy had you know, a 36 in that MCAT test and he's never had a B in his life, uh, and why did you turn him down? It's kind of hard to explain, but I hope you can see that we're looking at more than just GPA and MCAT. And remember, again, it's not what you do, it's what you learn from what you do that makes you a good and strong applicant. And I think that's it. Time for questions. Okay. Boy, that was rapid fire. Go ahead. The, when the, if the applicants from Idaho get that certification, are they considered Utah residents then, or they get the state price? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> in terms of tuition, they pay in-state they pay in tuition plus a surcharge to the state of Idaho that goes into a, a fund that they then draw from to help people pay back their medical expenses if they come, or their education expenses if they come back to Idaho for practice. Did the student apply the year he graduated so he didn't have additional classes to take next year mm -hmm. in the interim? What would you be interested in knowing about that student's proportion? Doing. Yeah, we want to know what you're going to do with the time in between, okay? Now, don't tell us that you're going to go to India and work in Mother Teresa's hospital for the second time unless you intend to be there. You'll want to know that, okay? Um, falsification in applications is unfortunately rather common. And even though, I, like I said, it's possible to confuse us, uh, we're not as dumb as we look. Okay? Yeah? On the national level, is residency determined by the medical school or the state? I'm sorry, what was that again? On the national level, is residency based on the school or the state? Who determines if it's state tuition or not? Oh, um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Who determines in-state tuition? Because it's possible for us to consider you as an in-state applicant you know, for purposes of application, but the uh, main office at the University of Utah who controls tuition, who threatens my life if I make any statements to the contrary, will determine whether or not you actually qualify to pay in-state tuition. That's, that is done at every institution level. So each state school decides how that qualifies. Okay? Um, where do I find out for more information on the medical sciences training program? Uh, the MDKC program? Yeah. Uh, you know, <clears throat> there is a website, and I don't have what it is, but you can, you can contact, you can go on the University of Utah website and then look for a link. Okay? okay? What is the record? Uh, uh, it's a wide range, and again, we don't weigh it, but you have to do at least eight hours or the equivalent. The average person will do about 30 hours. Okay. So I'm talking to all got to go. Thank you very much.